We're in the book of 1 Corinthians. If you want to grab a Bible or open up the app on your phone, 1 Corinthians 13 is where we're going to be. And I want to start with a reading from there. 1 Corinthians 13, look down at verse 4, if you will. Open up to that. Uh, 1 Corinthians is uh, very conveniently located in Scripture right before 2 Corinthians. Um, if you had a hard time finding 2 Corinthians, it's in the New Testament about this far through the Bible. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at home or you have a friend who doesn't have a Bible and you want to them, give it to them as a gift or you want to take one home yourself, please feel, feel, feel free, grab one off the table and uh, be reading through Scripture with us as we have a reading plan. You can find out more about that on the website as well. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, look at verse 4. And I want to just ask you, what does this passage take you to? When you hear these words, what environment, what event, maybe I could even say, does this take you to? Verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Where does that take you to? What environment? What event? Weddings, right? Absolutely. Everybody has heard these words read at a wedding at some point. In fact, even in the movie Wedding Crashers, where Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson are sitting in the pews in a church at a wedding ceremony, they're taking bets on whether it's going to be 1 Corinthians 13 or Ephesians chapter 5. And they're betting back and forth, which one do you think it's going to be? Well, these are the words here spoken at many weddings. Maybe they were even spoken at your wedding. What's interesting is that today, we're going to take a little different look at it, put a different spin on it, and we'll start with this. When I think of weddings, when I think of these beautiful words of love is patient, love is kind, the, the, the exact environment that I find myself not thinking about is the dude who stands down on the corner uh, downtown during like major events and is yelling at people through his bullhorn, turn or burn, right? When you read these verses, you're not thinking of the guy with the bullhorn yelling at people, you better stop sinning, you better turn or you're going to burn, right? Hell is on its way. Repent now. I don't really think of that so much when I read these verses here. In fact, when I think of that person who stands down on the street corner, or sometimes if the street shut down, in the middle of the street with posters and everything, with flames on the posters, and, and yelling really hard things at people in a very not-so-loving tone, I kind of think, maybe they skipped over this chapter. Maybe they didn't hear these words, love is patient, love is kind. I mean, it goes on from there, but you could just stop after those two things and think, maybe they didn't hear those words. Because while they are saying things that are truthful, and while they are saying things through the bullhorn, and they have Bible verses plastered up on their posters, even if they are in, encircled with flames, those words are true. I mean, Scripture says if you do not believe in Jesus, then you will not spend eternity in heaven, but you will spend eternity in hell. That is true. However, the distinction between what is moral and what is loving is crucial here. And Paul's been setting us up for this as we've journeyed through the book of 1 Corinthians. He's been waiting for us to get to this point where we would discover that there is a distinction between, between being a religious person and being a loving person. I mean, the entire letter of 1 Corinthians written to the people of Corinth, he planted the church three to five years before he wrote this letter. He's been dealing with all of their issues, saying you guys are fighting amongst each other. You're tearing apart the heart, the, the church. There are divisions amongst you. Some of you are sleeping with your own parents, and that is not appropriate in the church. You're, you're causing lawsuits amongst each other. All of these things are wrong. we got to fix the problem. So let's fix these issues. 
And then he kind of shifts into another portion where we started to dive into last week, talking about how now that we've dealt with some of these issues that are not right amongst you, let's talk about what is right and how we are to be the church alongside of each other. Now, Paul goes even a step farther and says, it's not good enough to just simply be religious people. It's not good enough to just modify your behavior to look more like Jesus. But he says, if you don't, even if you have all of that, even if you're speaking in tongues, even if you're, you're preaching to people, even if you're healing people, Paul says, but you're not loving people? then there's something wrong. Look at the first few verses here of chapter 13. Paul says this, and now I will show you the most excellent way that picks up right out of, out of chapter 12, where last week, if you weren't here last week, you can watch the video online, but in chapter 12, Paul talks about how you can edify the body, how we are the church together. Everybody has a different function, serves a different way, but we are the church together, edifying, encouraging, loving, uh, building up each other. Now, Paul says, I will show you the most excellent way, the one that exceeds all of those things. Verse 1, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Just pause right there. Can you imagine if Brian, who's our drummer this morning, can you imagine if everywhere Brian went, he brought some of his cymbals along, and while he was trying to talk to you, he was just clanging those cymbals over and over again, you would just want to be best friends with that guy, wouldn't you? I mean, like, okay, Brian, you can set down the cymbals. We know you love percussion, man. Just chill for a minute. Like, it, just imagine that. It would be so just wah, 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 wah. It would be that, that such of an, an annoying sound that you just wouldn't be able to stand it. That's what Paul's getting at. If, if I speak in tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm just this annoying, resounding gong or clinging symbol. If he goes on, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and surrender my body to the flames, even to the point of martyrdom, is what he's saying. But I don't have love. I gain nothing. Well, geez, Paul, that's kind of that's rough. I mean, I've been doing all these really nice things. I've even been preaching in my church. I've been going and visiting people in the hospital. I've been caring for people. I've been praying with people on the phone. And I've been doing all these things that I'm supposed to do as a pastor. I'm supposed to do as a, as a lay person. I'm, a, I'm supposed to do as a member of the body of Christ. And you're telling me that's not good enough? No. Because there's something so much more that scripture is about than just behavior modification. If church was here, if we gathered every Sunday, if we got together in community groups just to fix the way you act, we'd be missing the main thing. Remember how Paul started this letter way back in chapter 1 when we were studying that back in April? He said, you guys, you've failed to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus Christ and him crucified for our sins so that we would not have to live any longer with this debt of sin hanging over us, but that we might have hope because of what he did in spite of what I've done. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Paul's entire letter, and I hope you hear this because we spent a lot of weeks in the book of 1 Corinthians, and it's really tempting for us to think that this is just about fixing the way you act. This is about modifying your behavior. But Paul here is making a massive distinction for us. Following Jesus, being a part of the church, being a Christian, is not rooted in behavioral modification. But it's in heart transformation. It is not 
behavioral modification, but it is heart transformation. Hmm. When Paul goes and shares this with this church, says love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, and he goes on and on to describe what love is. He's calling to mind for every single one of us that this is not a matter of fixing what you do with your hands or your thoughts or your actions or, or what you do with your behaviors, but he's talking about what happens here. And you see, all day long, here's, here's where this message gets hard for me. Because all day long, I can point my finger at the guy with the bullhorn downtown, yelling at people, turn or burn, and say, dude, what you might be saying may have truth in it, but you're not living in love. It doesn't take long before, oh man, there are so many ways that I try to be a religious person to do the right thing, but it's not rooted in love. I mean, it happens when we serve and the serving has so much more to do with how we posture ourselves and how it makes us look than anything else. It happens when going to church is more about checking off the religious box and saying, yep, I'm a part of a church. It happens when the conversations with people who we say we love stay at the surface and never deal with matters of the heart so that we don't have to get into the mess of other people's lives. I'm doing the right thing by just checking in and calling and making sure you're okay, but I know there's something more. I'm just going to keep it at the surface. Doing the right thing, modifying your behavior to be the more better Christian, if you will, and yet love is not rooted in there. It happens when I see somebody selling the contributor on the corners, even just right out here as I drive in every Sunday morning. And maybe on a good day, I give a couple of bucks because I want to feel better about myself. And it leaves out the total notion that this person is a human being just as much as I am, and they need to be loved just as badly as I do. But hey, at least I gave a couple bucks. We're not about stirring up religiosity amongst ourselves. We're not about modifying our behaviors for the sake of becoming better people, but we're about showing the kingdom of God here on earth as it intersects our lives by the way that we love. Jesus said, you can sum up all the commandments in just two, love God and love your neighbor. But it gets messy when that happens, doesn't it? It's not easy. And as soon as we start this conversation, immediately we start saying, okay, well, well, if I'm all about these good things, and if I'm all about being a nice person, but maybe I'm lacking in the love department a little bit, how can I grow in that love? Look here at verse 4 again. This is amazing. Look at the way Paul talks about love, and not just a description of love, but he personifies love. Look at verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's almost like you're describing a person you know. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. Love never fails. Here's your dilemma. Here's my dilemma. If the moral of the story for us today, 
was, okay, I just need to love more, then we would be missing exactly what Paul is talking about here. Because he's not describing what a person who loves does. He's not saying, if you're a loving person, then you are patient. If you are a loving person, then you are kind. If you are a loving person, then you do not envy. He doesn't say that. He had every opportunity to say that. But he says, love is doing this. Love is accomplishing this very thing. Love is at work. And it's not a list of how to be loving, but it's actually like love picks you and breathes life into you. Instead of saying, I need to be more loving. I need to be more patient. I need to be more kind because that's what a loving person does. No, it's like love infiltrates your heart in such a way that it can't but help itself to transform who you are. And Paul knows here that if this church is going to make any kind of difference in the city of Corinth, then they need to have transformed people living out their lives in that city, not behavioral modified people living out their lives. It's a matter of the heart, and you can't do anything to try and be better at being transformed. I stumble over that all the time. It's like, I always convince myself that if I just try a little harder, if I can just be a little more loving, if I can just press into this, be a little more intentional, then I'll start to be the things that chapter 13 describes. But that's not Paul's message to you nor to I. When love is at work, when we receive love, it is patient with us. Love is kind to us. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. You can go on and on. And I love those words in verse 8. Love never fails. It's as if Paul wants to personify love to lead us to see the very person that he began this letter talking about in chapter 1, Jesus Christ. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud. Jesus never fails. So how do we move from being in a church culture in America that so evidently focuses on behavioral modification, being good people, to being transformed people, as Paul talks about here in chapter 13. Look at the last few verses here of chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. Love never fails, or Jesus never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, in other words, when Jesus comes back again, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And then he gives this incredible picture for us. It's where we're going to land the plane this morning. Verse 12. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then, that day, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. The imagery that Paul paints for us here as he closes this chapter is one of what we can see now and what we will see someday when Jesus returns. 
and we are spending eternity with him and the Father and the Spirit of God in heaven. Now, all we can see is but a poor reflection. And then he makes this move away from the idea of a mirror and a reflection, but instead shifts it to this idea of how we will see God face to face. I mean, imagining getting to see God face to face, seeing him, looking him in the eye. I mean, we, we don't really even get that idea anymore. I mean, the way that we look at people now is mostly through screens. I mean, yeah, there's interaction and stuff that happens here, but, but we, we kind of have been robbed of this idea of what it means to be face to face. I mean, can you imagine if tonight, during VBS, instead of having all the kids show up in one place and getting to play together and learn together and sing together, they just asked every, all of the kids to like FaceTime in. And they were all just watching what was happening on a screen. And that was, that was it. I mean, you know immediately what would be robbed from those kids and what they'd be missing out on by just looking at something on a screen. You know what they miss out on when they only look at something through a screen, when we only talk to each other through our phones, and really we don't even talk to each other anymore, but it's mostly just texting and emailing now. You know what you lose when you're not face to face? You lose love. They can't see the love. They can't feel the love that you have for them because it's just through words or a message or a phone call, maybe, and maybe through a screen but you miss the face to face. You can't see the love that they have for you. Paul is calling us right here to stop thinking about how can I better love people? And he's immediately drawing us to think, how has the Father loved me? It doesn't say a loving person is patient, a loving person is kind, but love is patient, love is kind. And the only place that I know where you can see love like that is in Jesus. It's face to face. You know when you're face to face with somebody? Have you ever sat down at lunch and I mean, you guys are having a great conversation and, and you both order uh, like a spinach salad or something and, and you notice that the person that you're sitting with has a little bit of spinach stuck in their teeth? Have you ever said that? And then you've seen it and, and you think, oh, should I tell them? Should I not tell them? I mean, what a conundrum to be caught in, right? You just don't know what to do in that situation. And then you remember somebody told you once, friends don't let friends leave without, you know, getting whatever's in their teeth out, Right? When you get face to face with somebody, you see the mess. You see what's not really the way it should be, right? And yet what covers over that, what covers over the mess of my life, even in those vulnerable moments, man, it is, it is not morality. It is not behavior modification. That doesn't cover over my mess. It doesn't heal me. If anything, it just makes me feel more guilty because I know I don't measure up. But what changes me, what transforms me, is when face to face with a friend, or even more so face to face with God, he sees my mess and chooses to love me in spite of that. Today is just simply an invitation from Paul and honestly from God for each and every one of us to ask the question, am I keeping God at arm's length? Am I just kind of more in a texting relationship with God where it's not really face to face. He can't really see my mess even though he does see our mess. I just kind of keep him out of that part of my life. I just kind of say, God, you can have my Sunday mornings like once or twice a month, but the rest of my life, man, it's too messy. I don't want you to be involved with that. 
and we just kind of keep God out here and, and buy into the belief that Christianity is more about how we should modify our behavior and be good people. But instead, this invitation to meet God face to face where transformation happens, not behavior modification, where we see God's heart for us, where we see Jesus at work in our lives, where we see that it was our sins that put him on the cross. And even in spite of our sins, he went willingly for you. He cares so much more about this than what you're able to do because he knows that this is where you can hurt the most, but this is where you heal the most. And he came to bring that healing, not behavioral modification, but heart transformation.